The bravura marches, which were now constantly blaring from the loudspeakers, cheered us up, excited us. But our reaction had nothing to do with Nazi ideology. The sailors were not too concerned with the consequences of these victories for Europe. They were much more interested in the consequences for themselves. They had no doubt that the war was practically over, and they rejoiced that the daily training, hardships, privations and dangers of war, as well as life away from home, would soon be over. They were not at all obsessed with the desire to hang around the seas and send other countries' ships to the bottom, while being in danger of perishing too. People were much happier thinking about planting cucumbers in their little vegetable gardens, raising pigeons or having a good time in a cosy beer hall. The team felt that our prospects were quite favourable. We had not yet travelled far from the Cape of Good Hope. Returning home seemed very pleasant, perhaps with a vacation on the beaches of Durban, or with a little vacation in the company of pretty Cape Town girls. To celebrate the fall of Paris, Roger ordered a pint of beer for everyone. Why only one? wondered the bravest of the brave. Because it's not over yet, Roger replied. Always maintaining the restraint necessary for his position, the captain was always aware of everything that was happening on the ship. Even the smallest deviations in the measured life of Atlantis did not go unnoticed by him. If people poured beer into the sea, the very beer he had personally given them, it could not be considered normal. Something's wrong here. The sailor, who was about to throw something overboard, frowned guiltily when he saw the duty officer approaching and hid his hand behind his back. What have you got there? the officer asked. A bottle. What kind of bottle? A bottle of beer. What were you going to do with it? Throw it overboard. What? The bottle? No, the beer, Mr. Officer. Why? It's hot. Roger called the barman. What happened to the beer that was distributed to the men? I was told it was warm. You understand, Mr. Captain, the barmaid hesitated. The weather? But the officers and I are enjoying ice-cold champagne. Of course, but it's from that refrigerator in the wardroom. There's no room for beer. I see, Roger sighed. Officers first. Of course, Mr. Captain. No, Roger said firmly. That won't do. If it's impossible to chill beer for the crew, no one else will get cold champagne either. Needless to say, the captain's decision did not find favour among the officers. But the unfortunate barman was hit by such a powerful flood of general discontent that he easily provided the whole crew with cold beer at the next celebration, the surrender of France. Cold champagne also poured down by the river. France had fallen. Such an event was impossible not to celebrate. In the wardroom, the corks popped merrily. Glasses clinked and toasts to the health of relatives and friends were heard. There was much talk of home. Very soon it will all be over and we will be back to our families. At home, life on the ship will seem like a distant memory. Years will pass, but we won't forget that night that was the beginning of the end. What about England? someone asked. A friendly laugh broke out in response. England will not last long on her own came the confident reply. And the Americans? Don't forget Roosevelt's assurances. They will not interfere. My God, I thought. Now all that's missing is a quote from Mein Kampf. But we've just listened to Fehler's brief speech on degeneracy and racial purity. Here's what I propose to you. Let's make a bet. I mean, who can guess when it's over? My personal bet is September he said, and circled that month on the calendar. A month from now, another officer suggested. And I think not before Christmas, said a third. Each of them marked a different month on the calendar, and one officer collected bets. Most agreed that the war would last another four weeks to four months. What do you think, Doctor? Ryle looked unaccustomedly pensive. If you insist, I'll certainly give you my opinion he said. I suppose it will be July, July 1944. This statement was met with friendly laughter. You are unusually optimistic, Fehler declared. The doctor shrugged his shoulders and turned to me. What do you think, Moore? I smiled. I think about the same as you, Rail, 
and I think I'll bet on July 1945. When the new burst of laughter died down, the betting officer said with a smile, You'll be lucky to keep the cash that long. I never got my winnings. Of course, it had depreciated quite a bit by then, but either way, I never got a chance to collect it. Four years, five years. In those days of resounding, resounding successes, no one ever thought that far ahead, so the doctor and I were instantly labelled ship's pessimists. Our assumptions seemed so absurd that no one took them seriously, not even our administrator, the most convinced party man. He persisted in indoctrinating the basic principles of Nazism into a dozen sailors, and May 1940 turned out to be a silver month for him, and June and July, golden, like the eagle, which he honestly and faithfully served. Calendars and champagne mean little in war. The Norwegian vessel Tirana we sighted on June 10th, approaching slowly on converging courses, its captain solemnly announced, I can't let the damned Dutchman beat us. The race lasted about three hours. The Atlantis approached within firing distance and... The Norwegian turned out to be a reckless game. As soon as our shells began to burst near the vessel, he returned fire and began shouting warnings into the air. It took us thirty volleys to silence the damned radio and the Tirana, our second victim, suffered the punishment she deserved. When I went aboard, it appeared that her upper deck was literally drenched in blood. She stood in puddles, and it was impossible to pass without stepping in one of them. Five men were dead, but there were a great many wounded. The captain was in a state of shock, and when he saw me he burst into tears, saying, But Norway is at peace with you. This was a new argument to me, and it led to long and serious reflection on the importance of continental victories while the war at sea was going on. On the one hand, we did have an agreement with the new Norwegian government, but on the other hand, Norwegian ships continued to go to sea. They were travelling to ports under British control, carrying cargo for the British, and therefore working to bring back the exiled Norwegian government. Tirana proved to be a valuable prize. She was a modern, capacious and fast vessel. Her cargo was also quite valuable, 3,000 tonnes of wheat, 6,000 bales of wool. She also carried 178 trucks, 5,500 cases of beer, 300 cases of tobacco, and a mountain of all kinds of food, among which were 3,000 cases of canned peaches and 17,000 cases of jam. We had already forgotten the taste of the fruit, so we kept some of the peaches for ourselves, but the rest of the cargo was planned to be sent to Germany. The Tirana was too valuable a prize to sink, and she was fast and Norwegian looking enough to escape the watchful eye of the British on her way to Germany. But she also carried a special cargo, incomparable in value to food or engineering products. The ship was loaded with the mail of the Australian Expeditionary Corps, the first since the troops were sent to Egypt, bearing innumerable traces of women's love and care. There were parcels of food, cigarettes, candy, and at least 5,000 pairs of socks knitted from the finest very soft wool. There were thousands of letters. They were written by wives and mothers, sisters and girlfriends, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, in short, people who had accompanied their loved ones to the station and returned home to pour their hearts out on paper. The refrain in them was the same. Write soon. Write as soon as you can. Take care of yourself. There were other postscripts, which were no less painful to read. I hope you liked the cake I'm sending for your birthday. What to do? War is war. With bitter irony, the officers of the Tirana told us that Melbourne officials had assured them that the local waters were perfectly safe, and suggested that the mines in the Agulhas area were nothing more than a legacy left by the Count Spee, which had already been sunk some months before. We could not afford to spend too long with the cargo of the Tirana, because although her radio transmission contained incorrect coordinates, and we quickly suppressed it, the traces of our battle were too obvious. We therefore endeavoured to send the vessel south more quickly with a small prize crew on board and orders to hide in the ice and wait for us to join them. England continued to fight, and by the time the city of Baghdad was attacked, some of us had already said goodbye to the hope of winning a memorable wager. 
Fire was opened on July 11th, and there was definitely an element of irony in the action, as the ship was a former Hanseatic ship taken by the Allies as reparations after World War I. Its outline was authentically German, and on inspecting the vessel I found that there was still a lot of equipment in the engine room that had been manufactured by German firms. After the vessel refused to stop, broadcast an SOS signal coordinates and our description, we opened fire. The distance between us was less than 3,000 metres. The first volley blew out the bulkhead between the radio room and the captain's cabin, wounding the radio operator and silencing the transmitter. Climbing aboard, I peered into the wrecked room, hoping to find the captain. Armstrong White was leaning over his desk, vigorously rifling through drawers to make sure all the documents had been destroyed. The cabin had been completely destroyed. The captain was clearly lucky to be alive. He was standing with his back to the breach and did not see me. After observing him for a few seconds, I spoke in a social tone. It's a little dirty in here, isn't it, sir? He mumbled without turning around. It sure is. It's been pretty messy around here, Captain. What an idiot. He shrieked and turned and stood still. He was, to put it mildly, shocked to see my German uniform. There was no doubt that the captain of the city of Baghdad was an expert. His signals, almost immediately interrupted by us, proved to be heard. Despite our best efforts, they were heard by an American vessel and relayed a request. Who fired on you? This pro-British neutral desired our description. All we could do was curse the fact that he was too close and showed a clear desire to help. But then it hit me, and we went on the air from our transmitter, using City of Baghdad codes, and responded briefly. It's okay. Error. It was hoped that the Americans didn't notice the difference. I remember two incidents related to the sinking of the city of Baghdad. One concerned Fela, who went aboard to do away with the British vessel. Where the hell? Rogger muttered, looking through his binoculars at the explosives boat that had just left the city of Baghdad. Did Fela go? I, too, pointed binoculars at the dinghy, but the owner of the luxurious red beard was not there. I don't see him either, I answered. A moment later there was an explosion. A great cloud of black smoke rose into the sky and floated slowly over the sea. And then a terrible thought occurred to me. I quite distinctly heard a familiar voice say thoughtfully, I wonder how a man left on a sinking ship feels. Fela was reckless enough to venture into such a deadly experiment. Roger seemed to read my mind. If that brainless... Just then, a figure appeared on the heavily tilted deck. It reached the side with apparent difficulty, after which, to our considerable relief, it tumbled over it and collapsed into the water. Much later, after a long and hardly pleasant conversation with Roger, Fahler said, I just wanted to experience the sensation. I hope, I replied angrily, you enjoyed it. The second occasion, my somewhat unusual encounter with the captain of the city of Baghdad, had more far-reaching consequences. The respect I felt for a worthy adversary from the very first minute developed into a sincere friendship that became even stronger after the war. Thanks to the issues regularly broadcast by neutral radio stations, we were not only kept abreast of world events, but sometimes learned amusing information directly related to us. About the same time that the City of Baghdad meeting occurred, I was once listening to a news review from San Francisco. Suddenly the announcer's runny voice briefly reported, The Dutch vessel Abekwerke has been sunk. Abekirk? That name sounds familiar. What do you mean? Abekirk? That's us. Soon, not far from the place where the Dutch ship Abekirk was doing its German work, a neutral Swede appeared. He smelled of fresh paint, the pile drivers. There were two more than the Dutchman's, looked very dignified. Few observers would have suspected that they were only two days old, and made of old barrels, sailcloth, and the wood that had formerly formed the main armament of the mothership. Inspecting the trophies from the first three victims, I had no idea that the next Atlantis encounter would bear very different fruit, a child's toy. 
children at the muzzles of our guns as the lifeboat from the burning liner. Kemendine approached the Atlantes, a little Hindu boy huddled and wept and prayed bitterly at the side of the ship. Please, Lord, save me. Please, Lord, help him. I pray to you, Lord, don't let me die. Save him, Lord. The child's black eyes, filled with terror and longing, followed the sailor, and even as the man grasped the bollard and pulled himself up and over the side into the dinghy, the child did not stop pleading. Once on the Atlantis, the boy continued to pray. It seemed he would never stop. Calm down, they told him. He's all right, he's saved, and you are saved. You are both safe. But the shock into the icy embrace of the boy when our guns began firing on the Kemendane was not so easy to shake off. Like a broken gramophone record, he kept saying the same thing until he fell asleep. We met the Kemendine on July 13th. The liner was going from Cape Town to Rangoon, and among the passengers were British women and children who had gone to their husbands in Burma. Also on board were Indians, mostly traders, evacuated with their families from Gibraltar. On that warm, sunny morning they did not think of danger at all, for the ship was in an area free of German submarines. When the sailors removed the blackout from the cabin windows, and this had happened a day or two earlier, there was much good-natured joking about the captain's over-cautiousness in insisting on observing this safety measure for so long. The passengers had just finished breakfast when a rumour was heard that a strange vessel had been sighted within sight, and with the excitement which always overwhelms sea travellers at such moments, the Englishmen interrupted their usual occupations and went to the dinghy deck to watch the process of separation. Even the Indians, who had hitherto been busily discussing the child about to be born to one of them, yielded to the general mood. To the passengers of the Kemendine, the war was very, very far away. We heard the radio transmitter on the Kemendine start-up. At 9.30 our guns opened fire. Good work, Cash, Rogger noted. The liner stopped. Its radio was silent. The flag was raised on the mast, signalling surrender. The dazzling whiteness of the superstructure slowly began to fade as smoke gradually enveloped it. Cash grinned contentedly. Yes, it had turned out quite well indeed. The gunners had done a good job. There was a clear economy of shells. One salvo was enough to accomplish the task. One shell penetrated the hull near the waterline, the second destroyed the radio room. Cash looked around at his men, satisfied that he had managed to make a flawless team out of them. Cash was far more interested in the mathematical results of his performance than in the effect of his work on the human element of the enemy. The fact that his accurate shooting saved someone's life was good, of course, because less experienced artillerymen could make a massacre every time. But that was a technical detail, so to speak. What interested him most was the speed of the artillery crews and the accuracy of the fire. We moved closer, watching what was happening on the decks of the Kemendine. There the passengers were boarding the dinghies. I was busy checking the equipment needed by the boarding party. And then the unbelievable happened. The gun at the stern of the Kemendine suddenly went off. Someone shouted, The enemy has opened fire! There was a rumble and a splash. A shell exploded in the sea not so far from the side of the Atlantis. The column of water that soared high into the sky and partially collapsed onto the deck was a symbolic exclamation point that ended the highly emotional remarks of our officers. I had never seen Roguet really angry before. In all situations he kept within bounds, a self-discipline practised over many years. So we used to think of the captain as calm and unruffled as a rock. Fire! Roger ordered, and the guns began to fire. We only flinched. All of us simultaneously had the feeling that Roger intended to blow the liner to pieces. Comens wrinkled his nose at the pungent odour of gunpowder. There may be some mistake, Mr. Captain. But once again a hail of shells rained down on our attacking enemy. Comens glanced again in the direction of the Kemendine. There's only one man at the gun there. A bloody fanatic who doesn't consider anyone but his own delusions. Roger didn't answer, but clearly hesitated, then waved his hand. Cease fire. 
But he was still furious, and with good reason. He had ordered a ceasefire because Kamenetz's interference had made him realize that under the circumstances, we could make a real massacre on the Kemendine. But that thought made the captain even angrier. Most of all, Rogger hated unnecessary risk and destruction, and the consequence of the idiotic act of an unknown artilleryman was inevitably both. When it became obvious that our revenge would cause the obligatory loss of women and children, Rogger's rage reached a boiling point. Women. Children. As I climbed the deck of the Kemendine, I mentally cursed the war, but finding myself among the blazing wreckage, I put aside considerations of humanity and concentrated on my first practical task, to search the burning ship. I photographed the saloon, a sight that was a perfect illustration of the devastating waste of war and the suddenness with which the ordinary and familiar surroundings become a devastating threat. Myriads of sparks flew above the smouldering wooden wreckage and flies of fire onto the thick carpets that covered the floor. I pointed my camera lens at the table, which had obviously been covered with a clean snow-white tablecloth just before the attack, and which was already being gingerly licked by yellow flames. Suddenly it burst into flames, instantly turning into a fiery canvas. A minute more, and the flames crawled in all directions, covering the wreckage of what had recently been a cosy salon. Knives, forks, dishes, napkins, broken furniture in general, everything that provided passengers with a comfortable life lay in shapeless piles under my feet. Minutes were precious, and I, tearing myself away from the sad spectacle, went to the cabin of the chief of the housekeeping department, hoping to find some documents there. But as soon as I began my search, the room was filled with our carried smoke. Black and stifling, it drifted across the floor, followed by a roaring and crackling fire. Abandoning my occupation, I hurried to the deck. When I got there, my heart was pounding desperately in my stomach. My eyes were watering, I was coughing, and I couldn't catch my breath. The usual sequence of operations on the captured ship had been completely disrupted. We had no chance of finding anything of value, was the opinion of all the members of the boarding party gathered on deck. It's all the 13th, Fela shouted angrily. We won't even be able to blow up the damn sucker, that reminds me. Good God, I muttered. Charges, Fela continued. We had stacked them on the deck of the Kemendine, and now, to our horror, the rapidly spreading flames were closing in on them. All aboard, I shouted. The reaction of the sailors was swift, so were the officers. We were in the boat in a flash, and we were off so fast we couldn't take anything with us. At the last moment I picked up two miraculously survived children's plush toys, a bear and a rabbit. At the same time, the lifeboats from the Kemendine were rocking in the strong waves near the Atlantis. The crew gathered on board and looked curiously at the unusual sight, frightened women's faces among many men's. The taking of a new batch of prisoners on board was not going to be easy, for the waves were getting higher and higher, and if a sailor could help himself, women and children could not be expected to do the same. Then someone said thoughtfully, coal buckets, and the problem was solved. Coal buckets are indeed exactly what is needed. The buckets, containers 1.5 metres high and 70 centimetres wide, were lowered overboard on ropes and the children were safely hoisted onto the deck. None of them were even bruised, although the mothers watching this operation definitely experienced many unpleasant moments. Then came the turn of the women. Each was tied with a rope around her waist and dragged on deck. An unenviable and very dangerous fate, for the success of the mission depended to a great extent on the women's being able to leave the boat at exactly the right moment, when the boat rose to the highest point of the wave. Fortunately, here too, there were no injuries. A pregnant woman was the last to be lifted out, with every conceivable precaution, and placed in a hammock. With so many prisoners on board, our once sparklingly clean decks were, to put it mildly, somewhat unkempt. This was my conclusion when, returning to the Atlantis from the burning Kemendine, I had to wade through a crowd of women, children, British sailors and Indians. Rogge was not pleased after hearing my account of the mishaps on the Kemendine. 
He hated to waste valuable torpedoes, and our failed attempt to blow up the ship meant that torpedoing it was the only option left. The sinking of the Kemendine cost us two steel fish. After torpedoing, the ship folded in half. Her bow and stern formed the sides of a huge, shaking-in-death agony letter V, which in a few minutes disappeared beneath the choppy surface of the sea. Our surgeon Ryle was not only a capable doctor, but also an excellent psychologist and just a good man. That's why he preferred to stay in his gleaming sterile white sickbay during the battle, realising that his patients were under additional stress hearing the noise of battle that they couldn't see. And the sight of a calm, confident doctor certainly had a calming effect. He also used the time to prepare his instruments, realising that when the wounded began to arrive in the infirmary, every minute would be worth its weight in gold. Ryle loved his patients, and they tended to return the favour. He hated guns, and when they suddenly opened fire on the Kemendine, he only cursed when he felt the fury of our retaliation. Ryle always wondered why no one thought to reduce the vibration that shook the Atlantis hull at such moments. The doctor feared that the shaking might interfere with complex operations. Now he had a new job, and as he made his way to the wardroom, he mentally cursed Roger for entrusting him with such a delicate mission. He was to be a friend and mentor to the women and children, to take responsibility for their well-being for the entire time they would be on Atlantis. Of course, it was not without envious comments from fellow officers, comments that differed from each other only in their degree of obscenity. But only Rail was not satisfied. He was much more interested in the purely medical aspects of the activity, and the captain's firm belief that in the absence of a priest on the ship, the doctor was the only reliable protector for weak women irritated him enormously. As he approached the wardroom door, the dapperly dressed doctor slowed his steps and nervously adjusted his tie. He swung the door open and almost recoiled, stunned by the outraged shouts. Unforgivable! Absolutely unforgivable! exclaimed with pathos an ugly lady sitting in the corner. It is strange that we have not all been killed. But madam, objected the confused young officer who was acting as host, it was all quite... Ryle did not hear the end of the sentence, which was drowned in another explosion of indignation. Please remain calm, Ryle said from the doorway. There was a pause as the women looked at the new man. Ryle noted that all the women, with the exception of the ugly lady, were calm and collected. But the ugly lady was a real piece of work. As soon as she was on the deck of the Atlantis, she showered the German sailors with every swear word she must have thought could constitute a lady's vocabulary. Scoundrels, murderers, men who amuse themselves by shooting innocent children. These were still the most decorous terms she bestowed upon every person she met. The young officer looked at Ryle with gratitude and relief. With the utmost courtesy of which he was capable, the doctor addressed the scandalous lady, noting to himself that she liked to indulge her desires, was quite vulgar, and perhaps had a tendency to high blood pressure. But he prudently kept these thoughts to himself, and smiling charmingly said, You have my sincere apologies, madam. What can you do? We live in very troubled times. And now, perhaps you would like something to drink? It worked. With a few more soothing words, Ryle had a chance to familiarise himself with the other prisoners for whom he was now responsible. His attention was drawn to a woman standing apart from the others with her 14-year-old daughter. The girl held her mother's hand tightly and looked around fearfully. Ryle did his best to make the most favourable impression he could. He found out that the girl had just come from a convent school and her mother was desperately worried about what effect living among rough sailors would have on her. Rail met an elderly Kemendine officer who spoke with a sing-songy Irish accent. His last name was McGowan, and he was the ship's doctor. A drink is a damn good idea, he approved. Nothing like a good swig of old Irish whiskey when you're in shock. Ryle reasonably suggested that his British colleague could use a drink as well. Would you like a double? Sure, and a clean one, please. But what happened to the little boy in the corner? He was crying bitterly, ignoring the women's attempts to soothe him. 
Where's my little chair? He mumbled through his tears. What have you done with my little chair? What chair does he mean? Real inquired. One of the women explained that the carpenter on the Kemendine had made a chair especially for the boy, which he had been allowed to take ashore in Rangoon. During the last few days of the voyage, the boy had watched the process of finishing the present uninterruptedly, marvelling at the skill of the kind-hearted carpenter. Poor little fellow, thought Ryle, for it is indeed a terrible loss to him. Ryle poured another shot of whisky for the British doctor, and after a moment's thought, splashed some for himself too. He felt that he absolutely needed a drink. I found Rogger in his quarters. The captain was still angry about the firing on the Kemendine after the surrender. We can't leave it like this, he declared. Have you found out what that idiot artilleryman is? He is very young and quite inexperienced, I replied, and a novice at sea. He comes from London, and in peacetime he was a window washer. A window washer? Rogge was genuinely surprised. At least that's what they told me. Rogge sighed and shrugged his shoulders. All right then. Really, what could one expect from a mere window cleaner? Reflecting on the fact that our best men, reservists and volunteers, drove streetcars in peacetime, worked on dairy farms and in cement factories, I still couldn't see how a man's pre-war profession had anything to do with his effective performance at sea. No court-martial, then? Not in these circumstances, Rogge replied and ducked into the papers lying on the table in front of him. If you ever need to get out of an awkward situation without losing face, take Rogge's example. As it turned out later, the actions of the so-called window cleaner, as far as we understood in civilian life he was just as likely to be a barrister, were later found to be lawful. It turned out that our first salvo had damaged the steam line on the Kemendine, which made it impossible to hear each other's voices. Telephone communication with the bridge was also broken. The gunner simply didn't know the ship had surrendered, and the goal was near and the temptation was great. For us, who had not seen the children for five months, their arrival on the Atlantis was an event of the utmost importance. The care of their entertainment was gladly assumed by the crew members who had left their families ashore. The first thing we had was a daycare centre. The name was certainly impressive, but in reality it was just a pile of sand piled in the corner of a fake hatch. We took the sand out of the ballast tanks, added a few toys that our craftsmen had made, and put some chairs nearby for mothers to keep an eye on their children. Although the equipment of the kindergarten was to put it bluntly poor, it soon became extremely popular with our young guests who, if not fooling around in the company of Ferry, Roggy's Scotch Terrier and Atlantis's mascot, played there for hours. Here too their admirers, both German and British, usually gathered, though I must admit that in this battle of childish affection our adversaries usually came out victorious. One of them, the petty officer helmsman of the Kemendine, had forever captured children's hearts with fantastic stories of sea voyages in which he himself was always the protagonist. I remember Robin because of his inexhaustible curiosity and great interest in all things mechanical, so he spent most of his time near our training gun, watching mesmerised as the training shell was loaded and then fired and rolled into the basket. During competitions between artillery units, he was invariably a delighted spectator, and our vigilant enemy friends did not fail to seize the opportunity to turn him into an innocent spy. Seeing that our team treated him leniently, they always questioned him about the rumours he had heard, in every possible way sought to get information from him about the layout of Atlantis. Two little Indians also quickly became everyone's favourites, a six-year-old boy, Gopi, and a seven-year-old girl, Bati. With a dexterity peculiar to their race, they endeavoured to take advantage of even the very slender chances for pleasure that existed on our ship. One day, when everyone was waiting for the cook to arrive, the girl was accidentally bruised by a door swinging open. She threw a real tantrum and roared until she got a cup of chocolate as a sedative. Gopi, seeing what tears lead to, followed her example and also cried himself a cup of tasty drink. After that, 
The clever children could often be seen at the galley door. They squeaked and shrieked in pain whenever it was opened. Their methodology was obvious to everyone. Once a young couple gave a friendly howl before the door even opened, but the cook didn't have the fortitude to deny them sweet comfort. The appearance of a privileged class of prisoners greatly aggravated the problem of their accommodation. We arranged some of the women and children in a cabin on the tank, where the furniture consisted of six bunks, a couple of benches and a bathtub. It was certainly not what was necessary, but we had no other possibilities. Some of the passengers had no personal belongings. The end of the Kemendane was so swift that we were unable, as usual, to collect their clothes. We had to get crafty. From our shirts, the women cut and sewed underclothes for themselves, and one lady, trying to remain elegant under any circumstances, converted a shirt given her by one of the officers into a kind of evening dress, adding glamour with brocade. The girl from the convent school remained very constrained and frightened to death. No one could get a word out of her. Her mother had calmed down a little, however, and when Rail offered her a key so that she could lock the cabin, she refused, assuring her that she felt safe on the Atlantis. Hindus? Their presence offended the sensitive staff in our galley. Black bastards in my galley, exclaimed the cook. The old man must be out of his mind if he thinks I'm going to put up with this. By chance I heard this remark, so I opened the galley door and poked my head through the gap. You'll get used to it, I said. Roggy was the first to think of how the presence of Indians on board could be turned to his advantage. A great fan of curry, he had always criticised the cook for his inability to prepare the fragrant rice. He saw the arrival of the Asians on board as a chance to sample his favourite dish, and he took it. Fine, he said. If our cook can't do it, the captive Indians will. There was only one small step to be taken from using Hindus in the galley to employing them in other work. The cock gradually became reconciled to the presence of assistants in his domain, who did every job without complaint. In other fields of endeavour, too, they had proved themselves good. The Oriental captives in general proved to be exceptionally useful men. Thirty Hindus worked as greasers and cleaners, and Muhammad, who despite his white beard and advanced age, went by the name of Boy, did all the bookkeeping work. The Chinese became stewards, and those who were stronger became loaders. The Hindus felt quite happy if their many prejudices about caste and religion were encouraged. They had their own cooks who prepared food without the use of animal fat. The Chinese were happy if their work brought in a percentage. One day after the capture of a vessel carrying a large quantity of articles of clothing, I saw each of the yellow labourers hold out for himself more than twenty hats, which he proudly hoisted on his head like a telescopic column. Among the native passengers of the Kemendine was one very old and still more austere Hindu, who kept his whole family, numbering fourteen, reclusive. In spite of the hot weather, the unfortunates never once during the whole time they remained with us saw the light of day. Most of the Indian merchants had lost all their wealth along with the ship, and surprised use with their philosophical perception of what had happened. Where there was every reason to expect bitter despair, we saw laughter and a careless shrug of the shoulders. The main thing is that we are alive, said one. We'll get our money back somehow, said another. They were right. It had indeed turned out exactly as they had predicted. Two years ago, on my way to Turkey, I stopped in Gibraltar, where I met a former prisoner of mine. His business was doing very well, thank you. His handsome store was bursting with Indian trunks, silks and carpets. Our meeting ended with the suggestion that any of your friends who are interested in goods from India stop by the store. Our relations with the European women, to whom we attached two stewards from the Kemendine, were formal and very correct. Contrary to Rogge's gloomy fears, the crew very soon ceased to treat the prisoners as something outlandish. They were reserved and brave, these weak women, and I can recall only one repeatedly showing antipathy to Britain and her cause. Strangely enough, we would all consider her the last person to have such feelings. After all, this was the same ugly lady whose complaints were frequent and always loudly voiced.
She so bored everyone with her endless complaints about little things, which the other passengers simply did not notice, showing a dignified calmness that we dubbed her the Devil's Throat. Devil's Throat was a very peculiar person and in time began to amuse us rather than annoy us. It was quite evident that she treated only one person well, herself. In particular, she often mentioned what she considered an outrageous fact, the fact that the bartender of the Kemendine had left his post after the first shot. You can imagine, she was indignant, that scoundrel left his bar at such a time as this. What's more, he locked it up. The consolation for this woman's hurt feelings was usually a hefty portion of trophy scotch whisky. One day when the whisky ran out after a party in the prisoners' quarters, Devil's Throat came to the rescue. It may seem strange, she said, but I happen to have another bottle in my cabin. We exchanged understanding smiles, but how to get it? We couldn't go into the women's quarters ourselves. Rogger had a hawkish eye for that requirement. Nor could the female prisoners walk freely around the ship. So we assigned her an escort, armed, according to regulations, with a pistol and two hand grenades. We watched the procession depart, a very correct, though embarrassed escort and a determined, self-important lady. When they returned, I noticed that the bottle was not full and the guards were displaying a timidity that was not peculiar to them. We decided not to ask questions. It wasn't until the guests from Kemendine left Atlantis that a discordant note appeared in the image we had formed of a fiery, bossy woman who always called things by their proper names and tolerated no objections. While going through the mail captured on one of the following ships, I came across an intelligence report from a British agent in Burma concerning the husband of our prisoner. It turned out that he was suspected of spying for the Japanese. Having evaluated the husband by my impressions of his wife, I laughed for a long time and finally decided that not only in Germany unpopular statements are taken on the pencil by those who like to pry into other people's affairs, but Rogger had a thought. He had received a letter from a lady in which she thanked him for his good treatment and mysteriously hinted that she was not English but Irish and thought it indelicate to mention this fact in the presence of the others. Well, what of it? Rogger wondered. Our bewilderment was soon forgotten, lost in a succession of daily problems. Back in Germany, however, we were shocked to learn that the Irish were making our propaganda on the radio and, moreover, that they had written an anti-British book in Germany. I wonder how that lady is doing today. August 2nd. Atlantis stopped for engine preventive maintenance and repainting. For six weeks we had kept the Tirana so on ice. She was waiting for us in calm southern waters. When we returned, the prize crew reported wistfully that not even the tip of a mast had appeared on the horizon since we left. Rogger concluded that this was a suitable sea area for the long-delayed technical work, and when they were completed, we intended to send the Tirana home, using her as a convenient ship to carry women, children and other passengers, whose presence on Atlantis in anticipation of new attacks would be inconvenient. We set to work, and very soon there were towers of scaffolding and garlands of paint containers on the ship. Painters sat like birds on a roost, or dangled from the rigging in the manner of bats. Sailors were treating the steel with mercury grease and paint. Acetylene torches were tearing through the metal, hammers were banging everywhere, and the atmosphere was more like a shipyard. Kuhn tore off his voice, and looked at everyone around him wolfishly. Perhaps because of this, the former bosun had earned the harsh nickname Captain Bly, although everyone knew that this man had a heart of gold. The preventive maintenance in the middle of the ocean was followed by no less hard work, the transfer of cargoes from Tirana, which could be useful to us, to Atlantis. The operation ended with the transfer of 100 tonnes of diesel fuel. The fuel hoses were disconnected, and the Atlantis slowly moved in tow behind her prize, making her way through the raging sea with the heavy anchor chain hitched to the tow rope to keep it from being too tight and breaking. By the time the work was finished, only our medics were satisfied, who, while not directly involved, had managed to get some very useful gizmos for the cause. 
For quite some time, our junior doctor, Ryle's assistant, complained to anyone who would agree to listen to him about the impossibility of continuing his studies. He complained to me too as we headed out together on the dinghy to another victim. Our prize crew went through a large amount of papers and mail before dumping it all overboard, and the water around the dinghy was covered with scraps of paper. That's when I noticed a beautifully bound book slowly floating near the side of our dinghy. I fished it out, read the title, and handed it to the doctor with a smile. That literature is your department, not mine. Sprung glanced sourly at the book and suddenly his eyes lit up. Oh my God, he exclaimed. It's a miracle. The book turned out to be a manual on the latest techniques of field surgery. Sprung was again cheerful and satisfied. His attention was drawn to the drill used by the radio amateur aboard the Tirana. How fine, he whispered in awe. How well balanced. What? I didn't understand. Our youngest genius is going to build his own radio receiver. Skullcracking, he muttered, and stroked the drill with his finger. With a little thing like this, I could repair any skull. I mentally hoped that whatever injuries I was going to suffer in the future would affect other parts of my body, but as it turned out, the drill did prove useful. Soon Sprung had to operate on a British patient with shrapnel in his brain, and the amateur tool helped extract it. After the operation, wiping sweat from his forehead, Sprung said, It may not quite meet the specifications of Harley Street, but I am quite satisfied with the result. The patient will live. At first, the weather favoured the repair work, delighting us with calm seas and clear skies. On August 2nd, it rained. This event turned out to be important because it was as a result of the fog accompanying the rain that the fifth victim came to us on his own. Fieldsticker ran so fast to the position he should occupy according to the battle schedule that he choked and at the first moment was unable to call the gun crews for communication. The unfamiliar vessel appeared out of the fog quite unexpectedly and only a few hundred yards from the Atlantis, which, shrouded in scaffolding, most resembled a fat, clumsy duck dangling on the waves. When the alarm roared, even Rogge lost his usual equanimity for a moment. There was confusion aboard Atlantis. People threw buckets of paint and rolled down the masts, or conversely climbed aboard from dinghy after dinghy like cats up a tree. They ran up to the guns in work overalls or naked from the waist down, covered in a complex mixture of oil, paint and sweat. One sailor hesitated in the dinghy and, when we started the engines, began to row desperately for fear of being forgotten at sea. Idiot! Failsticker shouted when someone who was running past stepped on his foot and immediately blushed, for he was just then picking up the telephone receiver. He never swore. Captain Bly swore too, but that was nothing new. The confusion settled down quickly, and the routine began to work again. We were back from being repairmen to trained sailors on a warship. Now we had to find out who our guest was. A cruiser. Unlikely. By an incredible coincidence, the alien turned out to be a Norwegian ship, the Talleyrand, of the same series as the Tirana. It came out of the rain without noticing anything but its relative. Five minutes after the announcement of the alarm, we opened fire, and the Talleyrand, taken by surprise, surrendered without bloodshed. Preparations for the flight of the Tirana were almost complete, but we realised that we should contact Berlin by radio. After all, if we did not report our prize and its course, on the long journey home, the ship could well be attacked by our submarines. But how not to give away our location to the British? After brief deliberation, Roger decided that before we sent the message, we would cross 1,000 miles to the south, transmit the information, and head for the northern Indian Ocean at full speed. We hoped that, unless of course the British came directly upon us, the direction finders would lead our pursuers to where we were not. On August 4th, we said goodbye to the Tirana. She was carrying all the children and women, about 50 male prisoners, her own crew and the Talairan's crew, a few Indians and a 15-year-old cadet on her long journey. 
The parting was not sad. As the Tirana touched down, all the passengers of the Kemendine gathered on deck. They waved their arms and sang. Everyone was in high spirits, and the British prisoners who had stayed on the Atlantis for the time being picked up the chorus. I didn't realise it at the time, but that tune made a strong impression on me, and ever since then, when I hear it, I always mentally return to those distant war years. It brings sadness and touches me to the depths of my soul. None of us foresaw anything bad for the Tirana and her passengers. We saw her off with joy and a light heart, and the song was called Farewell, Sally. The repair work was completed. We sailed through the shimmering, multicoloured waters of the Indian Ocean, and destruction was once again the dominant factor in our lives. Everything else was gone, melted away like a pipe dream, out of sight like debris floating in the sea, which for a moment appeared and disappeared somewhere beyond the foamy jet stretching behind the ship. Scientist, Tirana, city of Baghdad, Talirand, and Kemendane, the mines around the Cape of Good Hope were a thing of the past. On a stormy August night we approached the King City vessel. Frankly, they all seemed closer to me when I sat down to write this chapter than when the events surrounding them occurred. What matters is always what will be, not what was. Hunter and game in one person, by then there were about thirty British auxiliary cruisers prowling the seven seas. We had no opportunity to indulge in reminiscing about the past. If you constantly look back, there will be no luck. King City, we sighted on August 24th near Madagascar. This encounter brought excruciating bitterness to our British prisoners, nor did it leave us with pleasant memories. We shelled King City, though there was no need to do so. We fired on it, not knowing it was a harmless merchant ship, and we killed six of the crew, including four very young boys barely out of their teens. But such is war with the inevitable dirt that comes with it. I still don't see how, not being clairvoyant, one can avoid such complications. Anyway, there was a tragedy of which one of the British prisoners later wrote, this is the saddest story that could ever happen on a ship. Our forward lookouts first sighted the King City at night. The ship's misfortunes began when we noticed that in those waters where merchant ships usually follow sneaky alternating courses and seek to pass them quickly, she was standing still with her machinery at a standstill. It was suspicious. I stepped onto the bridge and at first saw nothing. After the bright light of the cabin, the darkness seemed especially thick and impenetrable. It was a starless night, and there was a light rain, more like fog, which reduced visibility even more. The sea was rough. How tropical, muttered the officer of the watch, lifting his jacket collar. I squeezed in behind him and glanced to the left. No, my eyes weren't used to the darkness yet. Damn, it's cold, it's a nasty night. It's weird, the watchman muttered. Hell knows what's on his mind. Through the night binoculars I could make out a grey, hump-backed shadow emerging from the darkness. That's right, a ship. But what kind? The chimney seemed to be the outgrowth of a square bridge, but I could not see the masts of a merchant ship. Another glance, and the vessel disappeared in the whirlwind of the squall. Rogge came up. We're going to turn and lay in a reverse course, he said. I'm going to increase speed to maximum and get a close look at it, manoeuvring began. Someone said, look, there it is. The misty haze cleared and the unfamiliar vessel took on a clearer outline. It was now moving at a slow rate of speed. We watched it for a few minutes, then it suddenly stopped again. Were we spotted? Probably. Yes, we were sure of it, absolutely sure. Think about it, said the signal officer. If you're just an innocent merchantman, why the hell don't you do what your precious admiralty tells you to do and leave? Which means, one of us added dryly, the innocent merchant is actually a cunning submarine trap ship, only it's not the submarines it's looking for, it's us. A trap? Very possible. We knew the British auxiliary cruisers were after us. Maybe they've taken a cue from us. Hidden their guns? Had the toothed wolf pulled on the sheepskin? While we were pondering what to do next, the unknown vessel started its engines again and began a leisurely mysterious movement. 
For almost an hour we followed it on a parallel course in full alert, expecting at any moment to see the bright flashes of its guns in the darkness. The vessel continued on her previous course, showing no interest in us. A cold-blooded bastard, said the officer who had suggested the trap ship. He wants to play our game with us, and even the taciturn Kamen's breaking tradition spoke up. Strange, he said. Very strange. Cash stood beside Rogger, two dark figures in the dim light of the Naktus. We'll wait until dawn, Rogge decided, if they'll let us. Then we'll start. Two shots first, in case we're wrong. If not, they'll get all the credit, continued Cash. I can't wait for this to be over, I thought. I can't wait. I was tired as hell and there was no comfort on the bridge. I wanted more than anything to lay my head on the pillow and close my eyes. I couldn't think of anything else. The voices of our 5.9mm guns were a resounding salute to the dawn. The battle flag was already fluttering on the mast. Both shells hit the target. Exactly on target. Two direct hits. A column of smoke rose above the ship. There was a pause, long enough for a man to call upon the creator for help, and flames danced over the deck. The bridge was engulfed in flames. We waited for a return fire, and we didn't. Our shells had the effect of a match thrown into a barrel of gasoline, causing a fire of extraordinary power. And against the background of this man-made hell, we could clearly see the armament of our enemy, a weak, small-caliber gun. And that was it. The only gun had no men, and its muzzle was turned towards the stern. The decks, where we had thought the six-inch guns were concealed, appeared in all their innocence, as empty and tattered as an open can of sardines. Launch the dinghy! We were now obliged to give as much help as we could. The excitement was intense. As soon as I looked overboard, I felt nauseous. A second's miscalculation, I reminded myself. And you, you damned fool, will have to fly six metres when the wave goes out from under the dinghy. A man could be maimed or even crushed to death on impact with the side of the ship. Giant masses of water overturn boats like toy ships. So quit your whining whiner and concentrate. With the crash of the waves and the creak of the davits, our boat touched the surface of the ocean. We were immediately thrown downward, as if an elevator had collapsed into a shaft, and then we were back on the crest of the wave, drenched and salty. All around us, all hell was breaking loose. Not for the first time and far from the last, we had a good word for the Tirana and the spoils she had brought with her. We had taken with us the Velboats from the Norwegian ship, which had excellent seaworthiness and were steered by Tiller. On a night like this, we found them very useful. Helmsman Cross seemed to read my mind. It's a good thing we're not on our boat, he shouted. I nodded back. We had already learned from our own bitter experience that our boats were useless in rough seas. The waves tossed the boat again, and Cross, who must not have noticed my gesture, turned his wet face toward me and spoke again. I said, sir. The rest of the sentence was drowned in the noise of the waves. Our adversary looked terrible. In the rapidly spreading flames there were figures flitting about, men trying to lower the dinghies, their only hope of escape. A life raft was thrown overboard. I saw it flop into the water and immediately the heads of swimmers appeared around it. The heat was felt even at a distance of 250 metres from the ship. From the giant fire periodically burst sparks raining down on the debris scattered on the water, on the heads of people rowing in the dinghies. It looked like a miracle, I said later, when I learned that the victims of our salvo never saw the Atlantis in the underworld that had unfolded around them. They took all the wounded with them, and eventually we were able to find them and rescue them. A miracle indeed. When the rescue efforts were complete and the guns opened fire again, this time to end the agony of King City, I took some pictures. That diabolical morning everything was going wrong. We were 200 metres away from the target and shrapnel from our own shells were flying back, forcing us to duck from time to time. King City was carrying 5,000 tonnes of coal from Cardiff to Singapore. 
Its voluminous inky masses moved and rumbled and rolled over in the holds before erupting like volcanic lava through gaping holes in the hull. We watched in silence as grim towers of black smoke rose into the sky and the bloody glow of the fire was reflected in the water, now frighteningly calm. When the ship came to an end, the King City gave out, a loud sigh like a sea monster in unbearable pain. The water surrounding the red-hot hull evaporated, enveloping the ship in a shroud of white steam. There was a piercing hiss, and the agonising monster rolled over onto its belly and began to sink slowly into the water. He wheezed and gasped almost humanly, and the water bubbled and bubbled over his grave for a long time. We returned to the Atlantis brooding and depressed. Cross was more than usually calm. In this man, one of the most polite men on the ship, one could not recognise at a glance a nimbly and skilful helmsman, a consummate master of small boat manoeuvres, a manly and strong man. He was gloomy and gloomy. So was I. We had had a chance to see the barbaric poetry of war in all its glory, and we did not like what we saw. So, Roger said later, we now know the reason for the strange behaviour of the British. It was elementary, tragically simple. We were simply not seen. In time, we learned the whole story. When our presence was finally discovered, the first mate of the King City ran for a lamp to signal us, but it was too late. Our guns fired and the shells hit their target. But why were you moving so strangely? I asked. You stopped, then walked a little way, then stopped again. God Almighty, sighed the exhausted sailor. Don't tell me you didn't know. As it turned out, the first time King City stopped was due to a broken fan in the boiler room. They managed to fix it and slowly moved on, but it failed again. The episode I have described was a real tragedy, and the very next day we noted a certain coldness in the attitude of the English prisoners to use. One of them said to me, In the case of King City, you were too hasty in opening fire. The boys didn't stand a chance. You fired at a stationary target and killed four boys at once, who were sleeping peacefully in their bunks. Then another one died, and there's a sailor in the infirmary dying, his stomach ripped open by a piece of shrapnel. He's married. He was in a hurry to get home to his little son, whom he hadn't even seen yet. You've done well, gentlemen. With those words, the British officer left. For the first moment, I was furious. When things were bad enough, you could not think of anything worse. You could refrain from commenting. I rushed after him, wanting to explain that a chain of coincidences had led to the tragedy, but I stopped. After thinking about it, I decided I shouldn't do that. How could we know? How could anyone ever know anything definitively in a situation like this? If our target really turned out to be what we suspected, then we would have to fight the waves and die in the fire. The fluctuations could have been our common end. As we gathered in the wardroom, we came to the conclusion that it would be best for all of us to never encounter this ill-fated vessel. Though such thoughts could hardly be afforded in wartime, the incident with the vessel Etel King, which took place two weeks after the King City tragedy, was also accompanied by misunderstanding. Its captain, a very cautious man, had ordered the guns to be put in readiness when we were still very far away, 11 nautical miles away. As long as we did nothing and did not change course, the guns were silent. But as soon as Roger ordered to increase speed and start the attack, the Atel King returned fire, and it should happen that our electric steering circuit failed and we spun helplessly on the spot. It took some time, but we managed the situation and got the Atlantis back under control, and the Atel King gave up shortly afterward, raising the W signal on the mast. I need a medic. Rail had already climbed into the dinghy when the signalman shouted, The ship has resumed transmission. A short order, and we opened fire but immediately stopped when we heard the signalman's voice. Error, error, it's another ship. The QQQ signal was actually a signal from the Bernati, which appeared to be getting very close. It had intercepted and retransmitted the signal from the Atel King, and it was his voice that we heard on the radio. 
Even after receiving a fatal blow, the Atel King did not want to go to the bottom. Its bow was sticking out of the water like a threatening finger, and finally we had to get rid of it by riddling its forward holds with machine guns. Well, even an ocean raider has to rest some time, Rogger said, leaning over a map. So far, Atlantis has been doing a good job. We've already had eight merchant ships with a combined tonnage of 60,000 tons. Not bad at all. Although our voyage had been quite long, the period of direct combat operations began after our encounter with the scientist. The old Hanseatic liner had caused the Royal Navy to think seriously, and it was with her that the war began in the hitherto calm waters. It was clear from the stream of radio reports and captured documents that the enemy had fully felt all the inconvenience of our presence, the consequence of which was sudden changes in traffic routes, cancelled flights and delayed arrival of urgent cargoes. Think like your adversary. This was Rogger's maxim, which is why a huge map of the Indian Ocean with the inscription Admiral Colombo adorned the wardroom wall. Imagining himself to be in the heart of Royal Navy intelligence in Ceylon, Rogger mapped the route of the Atlantis as it was to appear to the British. To do this, he connected the points of the first three operations, with Scientist, City and Tirana. Upon reflection, he decided that a competent scout would compare all the facts and conclude that the raider was headed for Australia. In June, another raider really began to operate in the area of New Zealand, and this could not better confirm our alibi. The intention was to mislead the enemy as to the identity of our raiders, and Roger chuckled as he imagined what would happen if our diversionary manoeuvre with the submarine buoys was added to it. If it worked, the confusion would be even greater. After all, no German submarine has yet gotten this far south of the equator. Put yourself in the enemy's shoes, Roger always advised. Think as he would think, he has to be looking for you somewhere and the more energy he spends on that search, the better. The black dots on the map which marked the movements of British warships, this information was reported to us from Berlin, were thickening around our operational area. Quite successfully coped with the task to set fire to the Indian Ocean, Roger decided to take a little rest, thereby giving time to fire brigades to use up their energy on the search. Atlantis headed south, in an area where ships almost never enter, and, crossing the so-called Australian trade route, suddenly came across the Commissioner Rammel, a foggy silhouette moving without lights. The vessel was sending signals on medium and short waves. Frog's voice had not yet had time to fall silent when the order to open fire sounded. Multicoloured ribbons of tracer shells streamed into the darkness. They flew into the middle section of the enemy vessel to silence the transmitter, giving away our location in the first place. A glowing bridge curved between the Atlantis and its prey, and a mushroom-shaped cloud of smoke erupted from the centre of the enemy vessel, like a nuclear explosion, followed by a reckless dance of flames. As in the case of the King City, the fire spread very quickly. We noticed a warning light flashing in the stern. Our signalman made out the words, send out a lifeboat, and then the light of the lamp was lost in the flames of the fire. We loaded ourselves into the veil boat. The sea around us was heaving with high, steep waves. The fire illuminated a vast space, but the dinghy would rise on the crest of a wave or fall into another trough, so that we could see the vessel only at short intervals of rise. As far as we could see, straining our tired, salt-water-burning eyes with all our might, the dinghies from the commissary split up in the wind. We had to stop the engine at times and move at the will of the waves to pick up the direction from which the human voices, so faint compared to the howl of the wind, were calling for help. Fortunately, the crew members' life jackets had lights on them, which made the search much easier. But nothing more eerie had ever been seen before. The commissioner's officers on the lifeboats lit torches, but we could only see faint sparks, sometimes flickering in the white foam that crowned the crests of the waves. What is it? Cross shouted. I looked to the right. There, on the crest of the wave, some unidentifiable object appeared for a moment and disappeared into the hollow between the waves. A wreck, maybe, though. It turned out to be a small raft in which a young man, 
almost a boy, was clinging with a dead grip. We approached him and wanted to help him, but he only grasped the raft tighter and made no movement towards us. Give me your hand, you idiot, I shouted, or you will die. I had time to see the boy's panic-stricken white face, his mouth open in a scream, but the boat tilted violently and we lost sight of him. At last we managed to drag him aboard. He was an ordinary boy of about fifteen, only he was struggling and screaming, Don't kill me, please don't kill me! At first I thought it was just hysteria, a normal reaction for a newcomer in such a situation. Only much later did I realise that the boy sincerely believed that we had rescued him only to torture and kill him. That was how we first learned the fruits of propaganda regarding our activities. The rescue lasted two or three hours. We were soaked and chilled to the bone. Personally, the sea had shaken the soul out of me, and I felt exhausted and worn out. Our enemy was still afloat, but now its hull was red hot. The infernal flames seen through the portholes created a deceptive illusion. It looked like an ordinary passenger liner from the bygone days of the world, winking in the night with brightly lit windows. True, the music usual for such a scene was not heard from there, and the sound accompaniment consisted of the howling of the wind and the loud crackling coming from within the vessel. The sinking of the Commissar was carried out in the Wagnerian tradition begun by King City. A gigantic mass of red-hot metal plunged into the ocean with a terrible rumble, and so rapidly that we were blinded for a few moments. Just now there were bright flames frolicking against the dark sky, and the next moment there was darkness all around. It was very cold, the penetrating damp wind made us shiver and raise our collars, and we could hear nothing but the deafening crash of the waves against the hull and the roar of the raging hurricane. The commissary's crew came aboard the Atlantis, which was quite a motley crew. The captain, a 64-year-old Scotsman, had been called out of retirement. He was quietly and peacefully living out his days in Australia. Of the other 62, there were 12 Frenchmen, 9 Negroes, and the rest Australians or Britons. There were hardly any professional seamen among them. Why did you end up in the Merchant Navy? I asked one of the sailors, a tanned, hardened Australian. I thought it was funny, he replied. 